keep calm, carry on. The Falcons aren't getting Deron Payne, but they're going to be just fine. You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So, guys, you know me. I'm Aaron Freeman, a.k.a. Mr. Drew, a.k.a. Sirius Black, and, of course, the most humble host that has ever existed on this planet Earth. Of course, I'm the host of this illustrious Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast family, your team every day. And we want to thank you for making Locked On Falcons your first listen each and every day, of course. It's free and available Monday through Friday on a variety of podcast platforms, including on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to Locked On Falcons on YouTube. Help us get over 5,000 subscribers, and you'll get the video version of the podcast the night before the audio drops. And you can also check us out on your Roku and Amazon Fire TV by downloading the Locked On Sports Atlanta app on your Roku and Amazon Fire TV. So today is Free Agent Friday, or possibly Thursday, if you're checking us out on YouTube. And... um. I had basically been telling you guys for the last couple of days that I planned on doing my breakdown of all the offensive free agents that I would personally, if I was the general manager of the team and consulting with Terry Fontenot, uh, telling them to sign. And I am punting that episode to next week. And the main reason is it felt a little bit rushed uh, for me. I kind of want to let things marinate a little bit more just because my process this off season was not normal to most years. Usually like in early January, I'm already starting sort of the process of watching uh, the film of NFL guys to get prepared for free agency. But this year, because of my trip down to mobile to the senior bowl, I was watching a lot more college prospects in January. So I really have only gotten that going in the last couple of weeks. Uh, And so therefore I kind of wanted to give it a a little bit more time to kind of simmer in the pot and let the, you know, those flavors come together uh, a little bit. So we'll probably wind up doing that on Tuesday of next week. Uh, We'll do a mock draft Monday, of course, on Monday and then Tuesday, we should do that free agent breakdown. And we still should be on track to do another free agent Friday uh, episode, breaking down the defensive players I'd like to sign uh, next Friday as well. So you'll get two of those episodes, offensive and defensive uh, next week. But um, so I wanted to apologize for that because I've been building up to this episode for a couple of days now, but it's still going to be a little bit of a free agent Friday, right? We still have some free agent news that I do want to talk about. And that is the news that uh, Deron Payne is very likely to get the franchise tag that's been widely reported by multiple people that indicate that the Washington commanders will place the franchise tag on Deron Payne. And if you made locked on Falcons, your first listen over the last week or so, this is not something new because we kind of discussed that. I believe on one of those Q and a episodes, mailbag episodes that we did last week about Washington, potentially tagging uh, Deron Payne. But now, like I I look at this situation and and while I, I think Deron Payne is a heck of a football player, To be honest with you, I'm not mad at the idea that the Falcons won't be able to get Deron Payne, right? I know Deron Payne for a lot of you guys was the quote unquote, uh, whatever it takes. Like for me, that's personally Jesse Bates to borrow a phrase from uh, our good friend, Steve Rogers in the movie Avengers Endgame. but we got to do whatever it takes to bring that person to Atlanta and free agency. Jesse Bates, the Cincinnati Bengals safety was that for me for a lot of you guys. I know that player was Deron Payne, Uh, but uh, again, I'm not really mad at the idea that the Falcons won't be able to land Ron Payton because he'll have that franchise tag because the projections uh, for what his contract would be if he hit the open market, people were talking about $20 million a year. That was one of the PFF projections. I know the Athletic had written about him potentially making $20 million a year on a new contract this year. And frankly, if I'm being completely honest with you guys, and, and part of the reason why I'm not too upset about this news is I don't feel like the Falcons should be paying $20 million for a guy to be the second best pass rusher on the team. And of course, I think the player that would be the best pass rusher on the team would be Grady Jarrett, who's making $16.5 million based off of that contract extension that he signed a year ago. And Grady Jarrett's really the alpha 
uh, of this Falcons defensive line and for the most part the defense. And so he should be paid accordingly. And I know to a lot of people that notion seems overblown or silly or whatever. But, you know, and again, I'm by no means an expert. I'm just a podcaster making myself your first listen. So I'm, I'm not an NFL player. Don't have that experience. I know you could easily confuse me. But the, the uh, professional athlete gene skipped a generation, passed over me to hit Devontae, my cousin, and my other cousin, Freddie. Uh, but so, I, you know, I say all that having not been in an NFL locker room, but from everything I've heard, everything I've seen, everything that's been told to me, like stuff like that kind of matters in an NFL locker room to, to, to a, a bigger degree than it probably does to your average fan in terms of like who's making the, the money, who's the guy uh, in the locker room. And I, I think ultimately at the end of the day, you want to pay your premium dollars to the guys that are kind of the cornerstone pillar type of players to your team and your, to your locker room. To me, Grady Jarrett uh, potentially, or is that guy and, you know, paying Deron Payne more money than him, you know, as basically as essentially a mercenary um, in that regard, doesn't make a ton of sense uh, to me. So I, I'm not too broken up over the idea of the Falcons not being able uh, to get Deron Payne. I, I know you wouldn't be able to tell this from just looking at their sack production uh, the last year or two, uh, but I do think Grady Jarrett is the better pass rusher than Deron Payne. And I think, you know, if Grady Jarrett is Batman, then Deron Payne would have been Robin similar to how Deron Payne is kind of Robin to Jonathan Allen in Washington. And I know if Deron Payne is out here making us his first listen today, he's probably a little upset with me saying that uh, he's, you know, he's probably making us his second listen because he's probably making locked on commanders his first listen. But you know, if Deron Payne hears that, I, I know probably part of the reason that has pushed him uh, to, to improve as much as he has over the last five years in Washington is because he kind of wants to emerge from Jonathan Allen's shadow, right? Because he was overshadowed by Allen in at Alabama. He's also been kind of overshadowed by him in Washington. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why he'll probably push to make more money than the $18 million a year uh, that Jonathan Allen is making in Washington. And we'll see if Washington winds up uh, doing that uh, in terms of a long-term deal over the next six months after they tag him. But, you know, I, I just think Deron Payne is more of a Robin than he is a Batman. Uh, and, and thus should be paid accordingly. But if you paid him $20 million, then, you know, theoretically, he's the Batman and Grady Jarrett's the Robin. And, you know, I'm I'm not mad at the the the, the reality that the Falcons won't be uh, getting into that situation. And what's kind of helping me keep calm about, you know, losing out on, on the potential impact player like Deron Payne, no doubt about that, is how deep this free agent D tackle interior D line, whatever you want to call it, uh, crop class, what it group, whatever you want to call it, right, uh, is this off season. And so the Falcons will have plenty of options this off season. Uh, guys that probably won't be individually as good as Deron Payton, but coming up next on today's Locked On Falcons, I think collectively they will be able to get more value out of this free agent crop than what Deron Payne could provide individually we'll break that down as we continue today's uh episode guys but first i want to tell you about built bar right the the protein bar that tastes just like a candy bar and everybody's trying to eat a little bit healthier this year and built bar is able to allow you to do that without having to compromise on taste and the thing that makes built bar so great the thing that makes them just like a candy bar is they're covered in 100 percent real chocolate you can get them in great flavors like peanut butter brownie coconut almond right and not only do they taste great they're healthy too they're only 130 calories, you're only getting four grams of sugar, and you're getting a whopping 17 grams of protein. And for years, I've told you to head on over to Built.com. You could still go there to check out various flavors and sales. I know I just went over to Built.com and, and got me the animal cookie flavor that just dropped this past week. But more importantly, guys, you can head on over to your local Walmart or Sam's Club for Built Bars because now at Walmart in the pharmacy section, you can get yourself a four bar box of cookies and cream or double chocolate, or you can go to Sam's and get a 13 bar box of brownie batter or churro. Trust me, guys, you will thank me later. So continuing today's episode, talking a little bit about Deron Payne and, and some of the conclusions I've reached from him being the Robin as opposed to the Batman is you kind of look at his pressure rate, right, from this past year, which, you know, he had a he got pressure on nine percent of his pass rush snaps this past year's according to pro football focus, which is slightly lower than his career high in 2021 uh, of nine point one percent. Right. 
Meanwhile, Grady Jarrett's pressure rate this past season in 2022 was 9.2 percent. Right. And frankly, when you look at his pressure rates over the course of his what eight years in the NFL, this was Grady Jarrett's fifth best season. So that's what I mean, guys, when I say like Grady Jarrett's a better pass rusher. And again, the film backs up what I'm saying, uh, but just giving you some numbers uh, for further, uh, you know, solidifying, cementing that opinion it is the correct opinion. Uh, you know, argue with yourselves. But, you know, that's why I say things like, you know, pain is more the Robin. Like, even if he has another year like he's had the last couple of years, um, that's still like the fifth best season of a great. That's an average season for a, a Grady Jarrett. Um, and then you factor in, you know, the fact that Payne was doing this on a much more talented D line than Grady Jarrett was doing it in terms of his pressure rate this past year. Um, and so, like, you can easily conclude that, you know, Payne getting 11 and a half sacks is a little bit misleading. That if you looked at his previous years, you know, how many uh, pressures he converted into sacks in previous years, uh, in past years, this would have probably been getting, I think, 49 pressures this past year would have been like a five and a half sack season based off of the previous year. So I do think Deron Payne's probably due for some regression from a sack total, not necessarily total regression. Could easily see him getting like eight sacks next year or, or something along those lines. But when we talk about players with with pressure, right, and and, and the thing I'll always insist, you know, the brand here on Lockdown Falcons, if you want to call it that, is you know we value pressure a lot more than sacks because sacks are not consistent year to year, right? Uh, while pressures are a much more stable stat year to year in, in terms of predictive uh, of value. Um, and when you look at the impending free agents. Uh, about to hit the market, there are several players that had higher pressure rates this past season than Deron Payne. That includes Javon Hargrave, Morgan Fox from the Chargers, Draymond Jones from the Broncos, Matt Ioannidis from the Panthers, Dalvin Tomlinson from the Vikings, and of course, our good friend David Onyemata from the New Orleans Saints. And then you look at guys with pressure rates of, you know, Payne had 9%, you know, of slightly below him at 8%. You know, you have Dean Lowry from the Packers, Jerron Reed from the Packers, Nathan Shefford, and then Sheldon Rankins from the Jets, Fletcher Cox, right? Zach Allen from the Cardinals, Jordan Phillips from the Bills, and then not far behind those guys at like 7 and 6% was Larry Ogunjobi, who played with the Steelers this past year, Puna Ford, nose tackle for the Seattle Seahawks. And, you know, rattling off all these names of all guys that are comparable to Jerron Payne in terms of pressures, not necessarily in sacks. Um, you know, I think it illustrates the point I'm trying to get to, which is that like everybody gets caught up in the one big name, whether we're talking about free agency with a guy like Deron Payne, or even when we get later this offseason, when we get to the draft, everybody wants the one sort of superstar player that is going to single handedly revolutionize our pass rush. And the reality is building a good pass rush is not about having one superstar or two superstars. It's about building that super strong rotation, getting four, five, six, seven or more guys that can put pressure on the quarterback and collectively that is going to give you a much more productive pass rush than one or two standout individuals. And so I, I look at that because of that, that belief in that philosophy is like, why pay Deron Payne $20 million when I can get two or three guys at the same price that are going to give me more overall production from a pass rush standpoint. And you look at, you know, some of the PFF, projections for the interior defensive linemen that rank among their top 100 free agents. Uh, you have guys like Larry Ogunjobi. He's projected to make $10 million a year. David Onyemata, seven and a half million. Sheldon Rankin, six million. Matt Ioannidis, six and a half. Puna Ford, 6.25 million. Morgan Fox, $4.5 million. And so I look at it from the perspective of if I sign Deron Payne, sure, I'm getting a great individual player. I'm probably getting an eight sack, 50 pressure guy next season, but I could spend $20 million and get three guys, uh, including some of the guys I, I just named. Um, and I might wind up getting 12 or 15 sacks, almost double as many sacks, and probably 100 pressures, double the amount of pressures. And when you think about it in the context of Ryan Nielsen, the Falcons new defensive coordinator and the type of scheme that he's going to build here in Atlanta, you know, having conversations with my good buddy, um, you know, my, my brother from another mutter uh, in Ross Jackson, the host of locked on saints, you know, one of the key tenants of 
you know, this what we assume Nielsen is going to bring here to Atlanta is having a deep rotation, having eight guys that you can be confident and comfortable rotating in and out of the lineup that can not only rush the quarterback, but can also stop the run. And when you look at the Falcons current situation, you only really look at three guys that you can say, yep, those guys are going to be three out of those eight players. Right. It's Grady Jarrett. It's Taquan Graham. It's Arnold Ebiketti, which to me basically means that the Falcons, in order to get to that eight man number, Right. Need to add probably five guys this offseason. And that probably includes at least two guys on the interior, possibly up to three guys on the edge. And certainly, you know, getting to the heart of the offseason plan of attack conversations that we will continue to have on this podcast and have had on this podcast. Like you can certainly look at the draft as, you know, being able to fulfill some of those holes um, in the draft. But that's part of the reason why, like, I am not as obsessed uh, with using that number one pick on a pass rusher as maybe some other fans as well as you know some other people uh, that cover the Falcons on a daily basis I will say no names but a, f- a frequent guest on Locked on Falcons is is very much obsessed with the idea of using that premium number one pick on on a pass rusher and you know while I have no qualms about using that number one pick on a pass rusher because I believe that you know the Falcons need multiple guys like I'm not as married to that idea as others because I'm like one first round pick is not solving the problem of five guys right or no nor is Deron Payne single-handedly going to solve the problem of trying to add five or more players to this front and so that's why I'm not necessarily married to this idea we have to you know pay Deron Payne or we have to use our number one pick because one guy isn't going to solve that problem of five players. So that's why I'm not mad about Deron Payne. We still have plenty of options potentially available this off season, not only in free agency, but also in the draft to get, you know, those other interior players to tag team with Grady Jarrett and Taquan Graham and Arnold Epichetti. So the Falcons are going to be just fine in that regard. But that's not the only free agent news of the week. And while I'm sitting here trying to do my best to encourage you that everything's going to be fine when it comes to missing out on the the Duran Payne sweepstakes, now we're going to switch gears and do the thing that I'm so known for, that earned me the nickname uh, Mr. Drew, a.k.a. Negative Nancy Drew, uh, here on the podcast, which is uh, I'm going to shatter your dreams Uh, about signing some of these recently released Tennessee Titans like Robert Woods and Taylor Luan to wrap up today's Locked on Falcons. Today's episode is brought to you by the Ultimate Football GM. You've heard me guys talk about this fun new mobile game that allows you uh, to basically make all the strategic aspects of your football team, whether it's hiring coaches, going through the draft, free agency, making trades, going through all the ups and downs of the season. And now that we're fast approaching the offseason, you want to sort of, you know, get that practice in and you can do so with Ultimate uh, Football GM. And, you know, the great thing about this game is you can play it online or offline. You can play it on the go. You know, I love the fact that I can go real hard on, on the app for, you know, a week or so at a time and then kind of put it away when I need to kind of take a break from all the frustrations uh, from this very realistic and challenging game that I have gone through. And if you want to challenge yourself to see how you can handle, you know, putting on those GM shoes, there is a locked on league that we've now created. And all you got to do is choose locked on league to join in the app and also Make sure you use Locked On as your promo code in the game store and you'll get 100% free boost to your franchise. That's Locked On, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N in all caps. And if you want to play Ultimate Football GM, just head on over to the website at ultimate-gm.com or look it up in your various app stores. Again, that's ultimate-gm.com, Ultimate Football GM. Start your dynasty today. So before we get into, you know, the titans cuts and whether or not the falcons should be interested in those guys let's quickly talk about the biggest free agent news of the week which is the highlander liam mccullough the falcons long snapper re-signed his contract and the reason why that worked out is because mccullough was expected to be an exclusive rights free agent right and those are the different levels of free agency is the unrestricted free agents guys that have four more years 
uh, of NFL experience. Then you have the restricted free agents, the guys that have three years, and then you have the uh, exclusive rights, which are guys with two or less years. And basically, exclusive rights work just similar to the restricted free agency where the team, the Falcons in this case, can tender them a contract, which is basically means that they automatically re-sign with the team, assuming uh, that the team tenders them the contract. And with the restricted free agents, it's three different levels of payment, depending in that affects compensation that you can get with exclusive rights free agents. There's only one level. It's the veteran minimum for however many years that they've been in the league. There's no sort of compensation. Uh, and so basically that meant that basically the Falcons were like, Hey Liam, we want you back at this veteran minimum contract. He really had no choice, but the, sign the deal now what well, you know why sit here and, and wait uh it, it, when you don't necessarily need to and for those of you that uh are curious if a team chooses not to tender their restricted or exclusive rights free agents then those guys do become unrestricted free agents which allows them to sign anywhere but that was not going to be the case with the falcons with liam mccullough coming off a very solid year replacing long time in, in pro bowl long snapper josh harris this past year and so, so hopefully we'll see the highlander Liam and McCullough, you know, play eight plus years or whatever uh, with the Falcons moving forward. And, and that ball is already getting started. But let's talk about the topic du jour, uh, which is, you know, we're talking free agent Friday. So let's talk about some newfound free agents that may be on the Falcons radar. The Titans released four players, I believe, on Wednesday. Linebacker Zach Cunningham, uh, kicker Randy Bullock. Uh, tackle Taylor Luan and wide receiver Robert Woods. Of course, the kicker Randy Bullock is not going to necessarily be on the Falcons radar because of Young Way Koo. And Zach Cunningham is notable because he was the guy that led to Rashawn Evans getting benched uh, in Tennessee. And now the Titans are already moving on from him. But we've heard buzz that the Falcons are interested uh, in re re signing Rashawn Evans. So we'll, we'll see if that happens. But I, I would not imagine the Falcons are going to be too gung ho on, on Zach Cunningham, who's a, who's a good player, but probably not in their wheelhouse. So that leaves Taylor Luan and Robert Woods. And let's talk about Robert Woods, who is a very solid, you know, could be the solid number two receiver that our previous guest, Dave Choate was discussing earlier this week that the Falcons need to find Woods is certainly well known for his blocking ability. So that makes a ton of sense for the Falcons, but here's the problem. Robert Woods is going to turn 31 in April, right? He was a, consistent thousand yard receiver in the Rams high volume offense. But in whether it was the first four years in the NFL in Buffalo or the last year in Tennessee, when you take him outside of Sean McVay's offense, his production has been very pedestrian, right? You know, you look at him in McVay's offense, he averaged 68 yards per game, you know, comparatively, that's basically what Chris Godwin averaged this past year, which again is a low level number one or high level number two, depending on, what you thought of Chris Godwin's performance this past year. Uh, we know Godwin is in that sort of top 15, top 20 wide receiver tier. Uh, and, and would certainly, you know, at least for several years with the Rams seemed like he was uh, a comparable type of player. But then when you compare it to the you know, five plus years that he's been outside of McVay's offense, he's averaged about 40 yards uh, per game. And that's comparable to Curtis Samuel, uh, who plays with the Washington Commanders, got paid a lot of money like two offseasons ago and basically has been a very bad, <laughs> has not been very good for them, which is why they went out and drafted Jahan Dotson with their first round pick last year uh, and, and gave Terry McLaurin. And so presumably, you know, Curtis Samuel is going to be their number three wide receiver in short order. And so when you combine, you know, that lack of production with the age, you know, that Woods is potentially approaching, where, you know, it's typically around like 31, 32, you know, we, we start to see wide receivers lose a step. And you, you're talking about what low end, high end, number three production. Uh, if he's not in the ideal offense, you know, while I wouldn't be totally against the idea of the Falcons signing, you know, Robert Woods, if they were able to, you know, up him on like a one year, I don't know, seven or eight million dollar prove it deal. I feel like you can get younger and better options at that position in terms of looking for a number two. So while Robert Woods, um, you know, should be, you know, certainly compelling for, you know, going back to, um, you know, LA or going to, I don't know, Minnesota to replace Adam Thielen or something like that. I don't know. In one of these McVay derivative offenses, I'm not sure he's the guy for the Falcons and talking about Taylor Luan, 
you know, I'll just be upfront with you on a personal level. Like I'm not the world's biggest Taylor Lewan fan and it never really have been going back to his college uh, days, but certainly I will acknowledge that in his prime, he was a, a very good player. Um, but the guy hasn't played a full season since 2017. He's missed 30 total games over the last three years uh, combined. And as far as I know, has never taken a snap at right tackle, not only in the NFL, but I don't think he did so in college, dating back to his time at Michigan over a decade ago. He's going to turn 32 in July. So to me, it just doesn't make any sense to try to, you know, the, the risk, the injury risk with a relatively low reward, right? You contrast it to a, a name that I've tossed out here on the podcast and elsewhere on Twitter over the last six months uh, of a possible, like Mackay Becton, right? You know, given his connection to Dwayne Ledford from their shared days at Louisville, you know, the fact that the Jets seemingly are about to move on from him, you know, maybe the Jets would be interested in trading him for some co- type of competition, compensation. We know Becton has basically dealt with knee issues and, and whatnot. And so he also has a significant injury risk attack to him, attached to him. But the main difference between Becton and, and Taylor Lewan is Becton's going to be 24 in April. So theoretically, if he can stay healthy, a, a team that were to require him as a quote unquote reclamation project, you know, theoretically could get like five to seven more years of production out of Makai Becton. With Taylor Lewan, you'll be lucky to get one year out of of production from him and so really the only upside to signing taylor lewan is you get another podcast that you can throw in your feed that you can listen to that may be fun and interesting but in terms of the football field i, I don't know if taylor Lewan's bringing all that much uh at least for the six games that he's likely to play this upcoming season so you know if i'm gonna sign a tackle that's on the wrong side of 30 and there will certainly be options you know beyond Taylor Luan that the Falcons could sign, I feel like there are much better options, not necessarily better in the sense of guys that are better football players than a healthy Taylor Luan is, which, you know, when healthy, you, you can make a case that Taylor wants a top 12 left tackle in the league. Uh, and so theoretically could be a top five right tackle based off of the notion that, you know, um, that would directly translate, assuming that he'd be comfortable making that sort of switch at the end of his career. But in terms of like over 30 right tackle, you can actually find a guy that played right tackle for the Tennessee Titans in Arthur Smith's offense, you know, that doesn't have the injury risk, that doesn't have the durability concerns that Taylor Lewan has. That includes Dennis Kelly, who was most recently with the Colts this past year, David Questenberry, most recently with the Bills this past year. And, and both of those guys have not only played started right tackle for the Titans over the last couple of years, they've also played left tackle because they've had to fill in for Taylor Luan uh, in that t- period of time because of all the, the time he's missed during injury. So it doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Uh, but, you know, I get why, you know, fans go crazy when stuff like this happens because you see a player that you've heard of, you know, again, I know this comes off as condescending, so I apologize in a minute. It is condescending, but you like, you see a name. Oh, I know this player. And so you say, Hey, what about the Falcon signing him? But I would just suggest that you guys leave those tweets and those emails in drafts, right? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure some of you may have even already sent me an email. What about Taylor one? And, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, you guys decided to make, uh, today's episode, your first listen, so that you can go ahead and delete that email that you were probably going to send over the weekend to be answered on our next episode, which will be a Monday mailbag, but also a mock draft Monday. And I'll be upfront with you guys sitting here today. I'm leaning towards uh, doing the athletic beat writer mock, which had the Falcons, our, our good buddy Josh Kendall of the athletic trading up for Jalen Carter. So that 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 is probably tentatively the player that we will break down on this upcoming Monday's episode uh, of Mock Draft Monday. But make sure you continue to make Lockdown Falcons your first listen because presumably, uh, if all things go according to plan, uh, the upcoming episode after that on Tuesday will be that breakdown of all the free agent, offensive free agents that I would like to see the Falcons sign. And I have them signing quarterbacks, running backs, receivers, offensive linemen, um, you know, all that more. It will not include Robert Woods and Taylor Luan. Sorry to break your heart uh, in that regard. 
And then, of course, we'll have still plenty of other content to come with the Combine starting next week as well. So look forward to that. Continue to make Lockdown Falcons your first listen. Always check out Lockdown NFL, Lockdown NFL Draft with new hosts Damian Parson and Keith Sanchez as your second listen. Check out Lockdown Sports Atlanta, Lockdown Braves, Lockdown Hawks as well as your second listen. All part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day.